And this week we're going to be considering a critical passage for all of our lives, and that's verses 21 through 33. And I've entitled the message, Marriages That Look Like God Intended. And so obviously the subject is marriage. And there's no denying that the quality of a marriage impacts every human being. Whether it is the spouses in the marriage, the children, the friends, particularly the church congregation, everyone is impacted by the quality of the marriage. And so we're going to be reading shortly uh, from verse 21, but we need to just make one or two little uh, mental notes before we read God's word. And the passage before us flows out of, and as if you like to use the term as I do, the passage we're looking at in verse 21 onwards is birthed out of verse 18, but be filled with the Spirit. It is a very challenging thing, isn't it? To as the day goes by, as the hours roll by in each day, to ask yourself, am I Holy Spirit controlled in this point in time? Very challenging thing. Puts the shivers up this man's spine, I tell you. And there have been things that have happened in my life. People have done things, people have said things, where I, like you, you have an immediate and natural response. You say, I, you say to yourself, I want to respond in this way. And the Holy Spirit gets the volume on the conscience, you see, and turns it up to loud, and then he turns it up to burning, flaming hot, so that you know that it's not his will to speak as you want to speak when people talk to you inappropriately. And so when we come to the subject of marriage, you can count on a few things being certain. One is, God is not going to give us instruction that you would find anywhere in the world. God is not going to tell us a set of standards that you will find out in secular counselling. And he is going to give us instruction which is going to be a direct and accurate reflection of his own character within his own Godhead. And so the text flows out of verse 18, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to read you a little slice of history before we read the passage because this will just put a little few flags up to help you understand why Paul is saying what he is saying. So this is just an excerpt out of John MacArthur's commentary in Ephesians because he's just got a, a little bit of history. So just bear with me for a few moments. In New Testament times, women were considered to be little more than servants. Many Jewish men prayed each morning, God, I think that thank you that I am not a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. The provision related to divorce and remarriage in Deuteronomy 24 had been distorted to include virtually any offence or disfavour in the eyes of the husband. In Greek society, the woman's situation was even worse because concubines were common and a wife's role was simply to bear legitimate children to keep house. Greek men had little reason to divorce their wives and their wives had no recourse against them. Because divorce was so rare, there was not even a legal procedure for it. Demosthenes, who was a 4th century Greek statesman, wrote, We have... Courtesans, in other words, prostitutes, for the sake of pleasure. We have concubines for the sake of daily cohabitation. And we have wives for the purpose of having children legitimately and being faithful guardians for our household affairs. Both male and female prostitution were indescribably rampant, and it is from the Greek term for prostitution and general unchastity, ponia, that we get our word pornography. Husbands typically found their sexual gratification with concubines and prostitutes, whereas wives, often with the encouragement of their husbands, found sexual gratification with their slaves, both male and female. Prostitution, homosexuality, and many other forms of sexual promiscuity and perversion inevitably resulted in the widespread sexual abuse of children, just as we see in our own time. In Roman society, things were even worse. 
Marriage was little more than legalized prostitution, with divorce being as an easy legal formality that could be taken advantage of as often as desired. Many women did not have Sorry, many women did not want to have children because it ruined the looks of their bodies and feminism became common. Desiring to do everything men did, some women went wrestling, sword fighting and various other pursuits traditionally considered to be uniquely masculine. Some liked to run bare-breasted while hunting wild pigs. Women began to lord it over men and increasingly took the initiative in getting a divorce. And that is the mixture of Jewish, distorted Jewish, distorted Greek and distorted Roman cultures that the Apostle Paul writes this letter of Ephesians to. The city of Ephesus was a city that the three main populist people were Jews, Greeks and Romans. And they practiced all of this quagmire of moral distortion and immorality. And so with that in mind, that's the background. That gives you a bit of a an ugly picture of the horrible scene to which this letter was written. So join me in your Bibles in verse 21 of Ephesians chapter 5. And Paul writes, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives. The word in the Greek there is agape. You'll know the significance of that, so I'm just going to put it in there. Husbands, agape your wives, as Christ agape the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any other such thing, that she might be holy and, and without blemish. In the same way. Husbands should agape, love their wives as their own bodies. He who agapes his wife agapes himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh." This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you agape his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Well, there's two key lines in that passage that we read. And I'm the first to admit that in today's PC environment, this has got to be one of the most controversial passages of the Bible. The world does not look at marriage this way. However... I would also add that this passage that we just read is the Bible's second most comprehensive statement on marriage. Next, first of all, to Malachi chapter 2. There is no passage in the Bible that defines and explains the, 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 the order and the operation of marriage as well as Malachi 2, but this is a very close second. So verse 21 is the beginning of our passage. And it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now we know that that verse had a comma at the beginning. And it was the conclusion of the section where it was talking about, Paul was talking about being spirit-controlled, being spirit-filled, and speaking in praise and thanksgivings and spiritual songs to one another with thankful hearts, submitting to one another. And so when he says submitting to one another, he is saying submit to every one of each other. Now that includes husbands and wives. Every relationship that exists in the church is to have an attitude of submission to one another. And we're going to stretch that out and see how that looks as we go through this text. The second key verse, second line, which really nails it for us, is verse 30. It says, for we are members of his body. We are members of Christ's body. We are the church. Christians are the church. The world is not the church. The world tries to get in the church, and much to our shame, we allow the world into the church. 
Worldly people were welcome in the church, but they should never be permitted the luxury of influencing the church with their values because the world's values are not God's values. And so we are the body of Christ. We are members of his body. And just as every member is dependent on every other member, so it is in church life that we are interdependent, whether we realize it or not, whether we like it or not, or even if we agree with it or not, we are interdependent upon each other for each other living, spirit-filled, Holy Spirit-controlled lives. When my life goes haywire, you will suffer. When you go haywire, I suffer. We were visiting some friends last night, and... I, I noticed that they had a number of pets. They've always had lots of pets, but they have a number of cats, and one cat had no tail. It had this little wee stumpy thing, and I forget, they did tell us how it ended that way. The other rest of the tail fell off somehow. Anyway, and I thought to myself as I looked at this tailless cat, what a strange thing. How does the poor brute flick itself and flick the flies off? It's like sheep that lose their tails and everything. You know, it's a strange thing. And the body of Christ is like that. When one part of the body is missing, everyone notices that something is missing. When one part of the body says, I don't like being what I've been made and I want to be something different, then the whole body suffers because that one member isn't doing what it was designed to do as God intended it to fit into the whole body. And so these two truths, we are to be submissive people. And I can't emphasize that enough. All of us, men, women, and children, we're to have humble heart attitudes. Humble heart attitudes that say, I will serve you before I will beat you. I will love you before I will dictate my love to you. Humility and a submissive attitude that says, I will not threaten you by words like this. Unless you do this, this, and this, I will not do that. Uh huh. And we all know this, this, this is life. We're in the marriage and family life and school and the workplace. And even when people leave a church from a distance, they throw back the little stones that remind you that they have an expectation that unless you perform the way they want you to perform, your friendship is under threat. And that is so very real. And so he says, we Christians are to be marked by submission. Which begs the question, if you're a person who claims to be a Christian, claims to love Jesus Christ, but submission is no part of their life, they need to be asking themselves a very serious question. I've been reminded as I've been reading this passage over and over this week in my studies, what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in first. Corinthians 5.33. And this little one-line verse has haunted me all of my life because I find myself very vulnerable to it. Bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. And so as we consider marriage, I want you to realize that if you have relationships outside of your marriage that are dark relationships, and they will eventually have dark influences on your marriage. There is no escaping it. If you have dark friendships that have very ungodly, unsubmissive, unloving attitudes and behaviors, it is only a matter of time. Mark God's word. It is only a matter of time before that bad company will corrupt your good character. You see, we Christians, in the name of love, we often refuse to deal with the realities that bad relationships affect us. Now, that doesn't mean we treat those people like enemies, but we treat those relationships with great, great caution. Now, with this attitude of submission, with an attitude of reverence for Christ, he says, wives, you're to submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And we realize that this opens up a whole quagmire of what our society thinks is inequality. But just let me remind you a couple of, just a few very brief facts before we consider the words of the text. God made man and female 
both equally in the Garden of Eden, both in the image of God equally. God blessed them both equally. And he gave them both the equal charge of going out and conquering the earth and being fruitful and increasing in number and subduing the earth and ruling over all living things. That's right from Genesis. God gave that equal responsibility to both of them. And likewise, when they sinned, when Adam and Eve sinned and introduced sin and disobedience and death into the human race, God equally dispensed discipline to both of them. So God, in every sphere of life, has made man and woman equal. But as you and I know, in life, equality often has the freedom of expressing itself through different roles and through different giftedness and through different abilities and different talents. And so when we come to consider this passage, I want to remind you, as in your notes on the back of your newsletter, of what God says marriage is. You see, if we forget how God has designed marriage, if we forget that God has a very specific design and function for marriage, we will lose the significance of these verses. And once again, as in your notes, taken from Malachi chapter 2, marriage is a sanctuary relationship. It's a holy, safe haven relationship. Marriage is a faith relationship, a spiritually dependent relationship. Marriage is a partnership relationship. It's a joint life relationship. Marriage is a covenant relationship, a formal exchanging of vows agreement between a man and a woman. Marriage is a one flesh relationship. It's a one life relationship, both physically and spiritually. And so it is important if we have any desire, any hope of God richest blessings for these relationships, we need to acknowledge that God's design is perfect. And when we live in that design, we reap the blessing and the benefits and the joy and the happiness of it. And so in our text, there are two ways that these truths are expressed in Ephesians. And the first, as we've seen already in verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands. And in spite of what some may say, this is not an open charge that, woman, you've got to be a second-grade citizen to every man on the planet. It's not like that at all. Remember, we're, we're designed and we're created in perfect equality. But in the marriage relationship, while there is perfect equality, God has ordered that the role, the the way in which that relationship is worked out does have distinction and differences from men to women. And he says there, ladies, wives, submit to your own husbands. You don't need to be concerned about submitting to me. It's your own husband that you should be concerned with. And so this is not a charge that that says that you are universally under the authority and under the lordship of every other male on the planet. It's not, that's not God's intention. And I cannot say it clearly enough. Ladies, you are not underdogs. You are highly creative, intelligent creatures, 100% equal with men. And you will notice in life that we all muck up equally. Adam and Eve blew it equally. And so in our lives, we get our roles equally confused often also. And so he says there, he gives us and he spells out what this headship looks like. He says there, first of all, ladies, that this is as to the Lord. This goes right back to verse 18 about being spirit-filled. And we need to have a clear view in our minds that an expression of a Holy Spirit-controlled Christian is that a primary part of their character, of their personality, is submission. That's to men and women. But ladies, it applies to you in the sense of being under the leadership of your husband. And that's what the headship refers to. It does not refer to superiority of the husband. It's not empowering the husband to be a dictator or a manipulator or a bully in any way at all. But his headship is purely in the sense of spiritual leadership. And this, ladies, is your service to the Lord. You say, but why? Why does God 
recognize my submission to my husband as an act of service to him. Well, he explains it in verse 23. The husband, who is the head or the leader of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. So Christ is the head of the church. In today's popular church scene, we have forgotten that. We are so busy trying to construct the church the way we want it. And you, you've heard me jokingly say at times about the person who was here quite a few years ago who made a comment that we need to get a smoke machine in here. Uh, well, Joe and I were just talking about that another church in Taranga has been faced with that very same issue, a charismatic church in Taranga, where some of the more spiritual people felt that in order to really usher in the Holy Spirit, they need a smoke machine. Really. Well, I can set you free, beloved. You don't need a smoke machine. You just need Jesus to be your Lord, to be your master, and to be Holy Spirit filled. And so here Christ is the head of the church. As Christ is head of his body. I've been thinking much about this over the last six months. We, we believe, because we're Christians, that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. But how does Jesus Christ physically manifest himself on this planet Earth in the city of Taranga? It's through you fellas. We are his physical representation in the city of Taranga in 2018. And that's why we are called the body of Christ. We are what other people see and touch and hear and smell, etc., etc. And so he says there, ladies, realize that as you submit to the leadership of your husband, that is an expression of your spirit-filled living as you submit to the leadership of Jesus Christ in your life and in your church, indeed in the universal church, the body of Christ of which he is the saviour. I like the way he plugs that in. Don't ever forget, we are eternally indebted to our Lord Jesus Christ because he is our saviour. Why do we submit at all? Because he submitted himself to the cross of Calvary. I have made an observation in my life. In fact, it's a twofold observation. And as you know, I'm 56 years old. I've been in church ministry since the age of 22. And I have noticed something about myself which is quite distasteful. But it's not, I'm not the only one guilty. And it is this. When I do not have a submissive attitude, I do and say wonky things. When I have not got a submissive heart uh, posure, I respond to other people's bad behavior poorly, and I sin. Now, I've also made the observation, the people who have caused the most pain in my family's life have been people who do not have submissive heart attitudes. How do you know they're not submissive heart attitudes? Because the almighty I is central in their life and not the Lord Jesus Christ, who is Lord and head of the church. And you will notice in your life, the people who cause the greatest pain in your life, whoever they are, wherever they are, they will be people, regardless of their religious convictions, they will be people who do not have submissive attitudes towards other people. And I can see by your blank faces, you know what I'm meaning. Submission is a critical, pivotal part of all healthy relationships, particularly marriage. And ladies, you have been called by God. You have been appointed the privilege and the responsibility of expressing the epitome, the highest, most focused expressions of Christ's submission to the, in the world, in the church, through your relationship with your husbands. And so women are not to be domineering, but mind you, neither are husbands. Women are not meant to be bullies, and neither are husbands. Women are not to be manipulative, but neither are husbands. But in the context here, he's saying, Wives, let your spirit-controlled living be evident through the Submission to your husband's leadership as an act of service, as an act of worship, as an act of lifestyle to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this will show 
in every part of your life now. Obviously, I need to clarify because I don't want to be misrepresented in this. This does not mean wives are called to be brain dead. This does not mean wives are called to have no voice. It does not mean that wives must always bow and say, oh, hubby, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. It's not like that at all. It does not mean that the wife is never involved in the decision-making process. It doesn't mean any of that. What it does mean is that the husband and wife, as they submit to each other and love each other and serve each other, as they work through life, it is primarily, and we're coming into it, the husband's responsibility to lead the spiritual values and the spiritual priorities so that the wife can follow and be the supportive structure that allows the husband to honour Christ. We'll come to that shortly. Now, we jokingly say all things, all sorts of things about marriage. Our culture is very cynical when it comes to marriage. And, you know, we talk about the head and sometimes we joke about the, the wife as the shoulders or the neck that wiggles the head. And uh, we all probably know examples where the husband and wife relationship has not worked well. But I will say this. I have never, ever in my life seen or even heard of a marriage that functions by God's design as divorcing. I've never even read about a marriage that functions as God has designed by both partners as being a painful marriage that causes pain to other people or to their children or to the church. I've never seen it. If you know of a godly marriage that has led to disaster, then please come and tell me because you'll be the first person in human history. They don't exist. Godly marriages bring joy, peace, security, love, compassion, and longevity. And it starts with a mutual submission to one another. And in the wives, it expresses itself through submitting to the leadership of a spiritually minded husband. And wives, if you're, or ladies, if you're single and you're looking for a husband, What's the primary quality he should have? He should be a godly man who is under the leadership of Jesus Christ. Because then he will know how to be a good leader in the home. Ladies, you, you don't want to go marry a bloke that's more interested in rugby, cars, or the pub than Jesus Christ. You want a man who has abandoned all false spirits and he has surrenders life to the Lord Jesus Christ because he will then understand what godliness means and he will understand how to be a submissive, loving, nurturing, caring husband, even with his imperfections. And so, men, as we consider what we are to be like, you will notice that from verse 25 onwards, uh, Paul really stretches out the instruction to us. I was reading one commentator this week and he said, the ladies got off light in this instruction. He just, the ladies got a couple of verses. <laughs> the men get a kicking for about six verses. So I see, guys, you're putting your helmets and seat belts on. You're ready. Um, and as I have, as Joe and I actually over the 30, almost 30 years of our married life have been involved in marriage counselling many years, all of that time in fact, we have noticed that the more we assist other people from the word of God, the more refined our own marriage becomes. And marriage is a relationship that it always has to be nurtured, it always has to be worked at, it always has to be improved because our own sinfulness will always sort of gravitate away from what God intended it to be. So husbands, here we go. Starting in verse 25, husbands, we are to love our wives. And, and why? We, why? Because the word the love is agape. And you know that word. You should write it in the text if you forget it. Agape is that self-sacrificing love. A good husband is never a selfish husband. End of story. There is no exception to that. Young men, as you are growing up thinking, what sort of a husband should I be in the future when I eventually get married, you need to realize that there is only one kind of good husband on this planet. He is a self-sacrificing man. There is no exceptions to that. And again, Jesus Christ is an example. So he says there, husbands, agape, love, self-sacrifice, 
love for your wives as Christ did the church. There's the example. There's the standard. How much did Christ give for the church? He gave his life. Wow. That means there are going to be sacrifices we make as husbands that sometimes will be very painful sacrifices. There will be things you'll do that you will not enjoy doing, but you do it for no other reason than you know this is the best way to express the love of Jesus to your wife. There are going to be jobs you're going to endure in that drive you crazy that you may even get to the point of hating. But you persevere in that employment until God sets you free because you know this is the way God has appointed for you to serve your wife and your family. I remember when my father had, not, not long after he had a second um, spine operation, and I think he had had three or four vertebrae fused together, and he'd been a farmer, he'd had to sell the farm because he could no longer work hard physical labour. And so he got a job after many months of unemployment working in freezers down uh, Judea, down Birch Avenue in Harvey Farm freezers. So his job was to take the boxes of food off the shelving in the freezers and to load them to the trucks. So by this stage, he was in his early to mid-60s, maybe 64, 65 years old. He'd had two major spinal operations. He, he had health issues, and he was desperate for cash. And mum said, I'm going to go and work. And he said, no, you're not. I will take whatever job. So he just applied for every filthy job he could find. And he got this job in the freezers. And he froze. Man, did he suffer. The physical pain he suffered because of that. In the grace of God, God provided another job after six weeks. But it almost killed the bloke. He, he was so crippled because working in a minus four degrees freezer for eight hours a day, he was allowed in and out, obviously. So, as a teenager, I watched this happen to Dad, and I watched the way my mum showed her appreciation for him. I tell you, it changed my view of marriage. His Dad would come home some days in such severe pain, he was speechless. And he would just go and lie on the floor, and Mum would get warm towels and hot water bottles and lie on his body and rub him. And there were times when she would just cry over him. And he served. And she never said, Trevor, you can't do this. Because we men know we must sacrifice for our wives if we want our wives to have any appreciation of the greatness of the love of Christ for the church. Husbands, your wives must be willing to see and feel the degree in which you are willing to suffer for their benefit when that time comes in those occasions when it's appropriate. And so, husbands, you are to agape your wives just as Christ agaped for the church and sacrificed and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her. Oh, man. It's at this point I get the shakes. In my heart, that is. Sometimes I shake in my legs because I realize that God wants me to be responsible as the head of the home, as the spiritual leader of the home, to sanctify my wife, to see her set apart. And you're thinking to yourself before, like, you don't know my wife. She doesn't want to be sanctified. And then you, some of you ladies are thinking, oh, fall on, you don't know my husband. He's as, as, as capable of sanctifying me as a blinking goldfish as of eating an elephant. It just can't happen. The man's hopeless. And that's why God has given us his design. He's given us his word to instruct us. He's given us his Holy Spirit to energize us. And he's given us word that we can sit in and meditate upon and say, I need to change this about myself to be the man who sanctifies my wife. Now, that means, the word sanctified means to set her apart as pure or to set her apart as holy. Now, this does not mean you go and lock the woman away in a cupboard because that's the only place you can be pure. It's not that sort of silly extreme, obviously. But husbands, 
We are to submit our attitudes, submit our egos, submit our pride, proud pride, whatever you want to call it, our proud hearts, and saying, God, I'm willing to take the risks. I'm willing to alter my life. I'm willing to alter my behavior, whatever it is about me that needs changing, so that you can set my wife apart for being more and more pure and more and more holy. That's a big ask. We men are not capable of that unless we are spirit-filled, spirit-controlled. Because in the middle of our lives is the big I. I want this. I want that. And we blokes, we know what we want. We want the new V8 commie, obviously. Every man wants that. Okay, I'm joking. But we have this big I. You might just be happy with the latest e-bike. But your wife wants you to assist her to be a more godly woman, even though she may not have said it to you. Deep down in her heart, she has an a yearning, a longing placed there by God that you would be instrumental through your leadership in doing whatever it takes to create the environment so that she can be more and more holy and more and more like Christ. He continues and he says, cleansing her by washing with, the, with, with water through the word. And just as Christ cleanses us, the church, through his written word. So husbands, we are responsible as the head of the home, as the spiritual leaders of the home, to be instrumental in ensuring that our wives are washed and cleansed and are growing and are cleanly spiritually dressed through our washing of them with the word of God. Some of you wives must be very thankful you're not married to pastor teachers because this is enforced upon you and it's not nice. Some of you men are so inept at this that you need to stop and rethink. I have, I am doing nothing. I am neglecting my wife in this area. And my wife is spiritually starving from scriptural malnutrition. Yes, she's got all the nice things in this life. She's got a nice house. She's got a nice clothes. She's got this and that. And she may be a very blessed woman. But men, if you are not washing somehow filtering through her life, healthy, right, submissive, loving instruction of the word of God, you are malnourishing your wife spiritually. And you think, but I'm not a teacher. Well, study. Or at least take your wife to be in the company of others who can teach her. And use your intellect to make sure that she is in the company of good, Christian, strong women who are submissive, who are thinkers, who can vocalize their beliefs without being aggressive and militant. Make sure that your wives are in home groups where they are under the instruction of the word or in discipleship with other more godly women. Make sure you sure you set your wife free so she can go to the ladies' Bible study where spiritually more mature women can feed your wife on the word of God. That is all inclusive in what he says here. So your husbands cleansing your wives through the washing of the water of the word. Wives, it's possible that your husband is utterly clueless at this. <laughs> and he's going to need your help. And so I would suggest in some marriages, the wives need to say, husband, how's about... You give me a bit of a hand with this. Can we go to this? Can we go to that? Can we read this book? Can we read the Bible together? Can we pray together? Can we have a family Bible time? Can we do something? Wives, it is possible that your husband is secretly waiting for you to make that request. For those of us that are single men, now is the time while you are single to be diligent students of the Bible so that when the day comes when you are married, you will be able to humbly input the word of God into your wife's life so that as a team, as a husband and wife, you grow and mature together as Christians and as healthy husband and wives were intended by God. Men, it is a terribly cowardice thing to ignore the word of the living God. You see, the study of theology has always been and will always remain as much an issue of integrity as it is a matter of truth. 
And I really want you to let that sink in. The study of theology is as much an issue of integrity as it is a matter of truth. You will know, really mean, what's deeply within your heart according to your attitude towards the truth, the doctrines, the theology of the Bible. And so we need to be growing and maturing in that, men, so that our wives and our children will benefit. Now, there's an offshoot to that which you may not have thought of, and it's this. Here's a little bit of application that sort of flows on. Most people get married and have children. And those children grow up to be one of two people, either a believer or a non-believer. That's a fact, isn't it? They either grow up to be Christians or non-Christians. If you are a good husband who faithfully and submissively instructs your wife and your family in the word of God, if your children repent and turn to the living Lord Jesus Christ, they will be well instructed in the truths of the Bible and they will know how to live a Christian life. Likewise, husbands, and you really need to let this one sink in because the world will never tell you this. If you are a good husband who faithfully and submissively instructs the word of God into your wife and your family, for those children of yours who reject and choose to disbelieve in Jesus Christ, they will have such a clear understanding of what the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ that they will never have the excuse of saying, oh, nobody ever told me. Or, I didn't understand that. They will have no one to point the finger at. And in time, under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, they will realize all fingers of responsibility points back to themselves because my father taught me the Bible. One of my most profound memories as a child is when my father, when he came in from feeding the pigs at um, 7 o'clock each morning, he would eat his bowl of porridge huge bowl of porridge and then he would sit the little the baby of the family Lincoln on his knee and he would put the Bible on the table and he would sit my two older brothers beside and he would instruct us in the word of God I tell you that changed my life is it no wonder as a five year old I understood what the word repentance meant I understood what sin was and I understood the justness of being sent to hell for rejecting Jesus Christ And so I turned to the Saviour for salvation. Husbands, realise it is a privilege. It is a huge, humbling privilege to be able to wash your wife and your family in the Word of God. If you need help, come and ask Tom or ask myself or ask Dennis. We can give you assistance. But men, wash your wives well in the Word of God. They will love you for it. This is not a licence to be a dictating bully Bible teacher but to share in the word of God together. Well, he goes, and men, you are to present her as Christ presented uh, the church to himself in splendor. So husbands are to present their wives to Christ in splendor. What's that mean? Without spot, without wrinkle, holy and without blemish. Oh, it sort of takes your breath away, doesn't it? (laughs) God has designed marriage. He's equipped us with the word of God and he's given us the Holy Spirit to uh, energize us husbands should we submit to the Holy Spirit's leading so that we can be the spiritual Botox effect in our wives' spiritual lives. That's a mouthful, isn't it? And I pray it does remove her facial wrinkles as well. But that's not the point. The point is, when a husband is a good God-designed God, an energized husband, he will lead his wife. He will not whip her. He will not kick her along and say, come on, woman, get him behind me. He will say, let's do this together. Let's become like Christ together. Let's be servants in the church together. Let's have intentional friendships with other people together. Let's study the word together, etc., etc. And in that process, The wife loses her spiritual wrinkles, which is a reference to spiritual imperfections. And in that process, husbands, you will lose your spiritual imperfections as well as you are correctly prioritizing your relationships, correctly prioritizing the way you spend your time, the way you spend your money, etc., etc. 
It puts the fear of eternity up me when I think or I question myself, how well am I actually removing my wife's spiritual blemishes? Oh yeah, I'm trying to move on. Husbands, you're to love your wives as your own body. Now here's the thing. We may not like our bodies necessarily. We may not like all the imperfections we have, some of those things we were born with, some of those things are imperfect in our bodies because of the way we have treated them. But you notice what we do naturally with our bodies? We keep stuffing food into them every day. <laughs> we sleep. And when we're not well, we go to the doctor to get patched up. And those are all right, good, healthy, appropriate things to do. We have an innate love for our bodies. And husbands, the point is very simply this. Don't claim to love Christ unless you are loving your wife in this manner. Don't claim to love yourself if you are not loving your wife in this way because if you truly loved yourself, you would want the best for your wife. You would be willing to be the man that God has called you to be, to be a leader, a man of courage, a man of grace and mercy who stands up for truth in a humble way but whose feet are stuck firmly in the foundation of God's word. Love your wife, he says in verse 31, as separate from the authority of your parents. Likewise, your wives can't still be living under the authority of her parents. Look at it. This is a wonderful facet of marriage. Uh, verse 31. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And mystery is profound, he says. But I'm saying this refers to Christ and the church. So this is how it is to be in Christian life, in Christian marriages. Husbands, you step out from under the authority of your parents and you take a wife and you establish your new home as you're the head of the home. And wives, you remove yourself from under the direct headship of your parents and you come alongside the leadership the headship of your husband under Jesus Christ. In the years of marriage counselling, we have been shocked. Unfortunately, this is more dominant in Christian marriages where the newlyweds come together and mum or dad still have a voice of authority. That's not how we did it in our day. That's not how I did it in my marriage, young lady. Did you know? And so it goes on and on. Godly parents can release their children to marriage because they know they've done a good job of washing their children in the word of God. So they are prepared. And so we as a church do that also. And so this is a this is a, a cautionary note for husbands is that we need to recognize when... Parental influence is too overwhelming, too overpowering, or overly influential on your marriage. And the umbilical cord needs to be cut. Now that does not mean you cut your parents out of your life. You don't misrepresent me that way. It means that you, first of all, before you approach the subject of the parents' influence, you make sure, husbands, that you are the leader of the home. That you are fulfilling God's design for your home that you are washing your wife, that you are cleansing your wife, that you are nurturing her, you are submitting to her. Only then are you qualified to address the influence from external sources. And those times do come. And there are times when a godly wife will say to her husband, husband, you need to wake up to this. This person's not good for you. I'm willing to sacrifice the amount of time we spend with that person because I recognize that person is not healthy for you. I'm not saying treat them as an enemy. I'm not saying to completely cut them out of your life. But they are given too many opportunities to speak into our lives and into our marriage. And I recognize under the headship of Jesus Christ, this is not healthy. So I'm asking, I'm suggesting and I'm saying we, we need to work at this together to remove unhealthy external influences, and often they do come from parents, unfortunately. I want to conclude with a very simple statement. I think I put it on your notes, and we'll close in prayer with that. 
God's healthy church has healthy marriages that are inti- that imitate God. God's healthy church has healthy marriages that imitate God. Father, we need you to help us with this.